Hello, and thanks for joining us at the Writer's Podcast. I'm Raymond Esposito, and I'm here with my co-host, the other reason why Clef Jean wants to speak Spanish, and the inspiration behind those really short water fountains. Award-winning author, S. Catherine Anthony. I'm pretty sure that was Shakira. Mm -hmm. Um, I'll let her have it. Maybe I'll take the water Mm -hmm. fountain since I am short, but the art of writing, it requires a lot of practice. And since it's such a layered craft, Improvement also comes in the years. True. When we think of writing, we think of the final product, the entire story. But deciding how to improve both a story and your overall craft, that requires an examination of all and each of the parts. Questions such as improvement needed with grammar, with character development, pacing, with the plot, or even the dialogue. You can sort of think of it like you would baking. There's the actual dessert you're making say chocolate cake versus carrot cake. And then there's the ingredient and the quality of the ingredients, the amount you use, and the order that you add them. How long you bake it all and how long you let it cool. And finally, you have to consider the presentation. And like writing, some of the things have hard and fast rules, like you can't replace sugar with salt. And some are more about taste. Some people like things a little sweeter and some prefer less. So when you're figuring out the places where you can improve your writing, you need to be able to separate the subjective stuff from the objective stuff before you can focus on the right stuff. Objectivity, of course, is the biggest obstacle to improvement. For example, feedback from reviews can be very subjective. They can. There may, yeah, there may be nothing wrong with your style or mechanics. The reader may simply not like the story or the ending or a character. You can make the best damn German chocolate cake in the world, but I'm still not going to like that bitter stuff. But, and it's a big but, the most difficult step is recognizing a need for improvement. It's an emotional hardship to admit your writing needs work because it's such a personal craft. And because you wouldn't have published it if you didn't think it was ready. On this topic, there are two types of writers. The ones who want to improve and the ones who don't realize they need to improve. Mm -hmm. And for either, successful improvement requires the correct emotional balance. In this episode, we'll be discussing this topic in terms of how we approach writing emotionally. In other words, how to overcome the obstacles we set for ourselves mentally. More specifically, we'll be borrowing from the Kubler-Ross model, otherwise known as the five stages of grief, and we'll use this to share our observations with you. Maybe some or all of these stages will sound familiar or resonate with many writers, especially when you're first starting out. Writing development is the same as any aspect of human skills. It builds over time and with practice. One way to look at it is with the famous 10,000 hour rule, which says it requires 10,000 hours of work to master any skill. So before you get too hard on yourself, consider that if this rule is correct and you wrote for two hours a day, seven days a week, it will take you almost 14 years to master the craft of writing. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. Um, But now, the things that can speed up that process or slow it down depend on a lot of factors. But the first step is recognizing the five stages of writing grief and working through them objectively. So our mission in this episode is to discuss the cycles of emotions, highlight the typical emotions and behaviors you will see in each stage, and provide some practical tips to help you overcome each. Let's start at the beginning with the first stage in the cycle. The stage where a writer isn't quite ready to admit there is a problem, which is denial. There are two forms of denial. The first is the writer who has invested so much time into the work, they can't bear the thought of having to go back to it. Often these writers think, no way do I need to research or learn anything else because I'm just so good. (laughs) The second type of writer can't see their strengths and their weaknesses and their denial takes a form of I'm just not good enough I can't do this whichever your issues the result is the same it's impossible to improve if you're so emotionally invested in the work that you can't take an objective look at the issues usually it's the first type of denier who simply lacks 
knowledge of the writing rules. They can't understand why the use of a cliche is a bad idea, or they can't see the struggle created by their run-on sentences. The second type struggles with the overwhelming need for perfectionism. (laughs) (laughs) Interesting that this is your point. Um, Well, you know, we can get so consumed with the need to make every word and sentence perfect that we start fixing things that are unbroken. And we no longer have any sense of the things we should actually be working on. Mm -hmm. Now, Dean Koontz, he has a a, a policy in his writing. He doesn't leave a page until he believes it's perfect. Um, Oh, wow. So you might be in good company. Uh, (laughs) For our first type, though, of denier, the issue does stem from a lack of research and training. It's really a case of not knowing what they don't know. Usually, these are new writers who are so fueled by the belief that it's different for me that they dismiss the advice and instructions they receive. Yeah, and the only way for this person to move through this stage is to study and listen more. Uh, The same is true for the second type, but for them, the answer is to listen to the advice, but not to take any specific criticism they hear and then generalize that to their entire book. You know, Raymond, there is one simple truism to overcome the denial stage. You have to admit there is a problem before you can fix it. So how do you know if you're in denial if you're in denial? (laughs) Well, if you're one who believes you know everything there is to know, but are constantly shocked by the industry standards, maybe it's time to at least read up on what they're saying before assuming you're king or queen of publishing. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) and you also have to be aware and, and beware of confirmation bias. There are a lot of opinions and information out there, so when conducting your research, don't just read a few lines that seemingly support what you already believe. In other words, don't just search for the places where you can say, oh, I already do that. Search for the places that disagree with how you're doing things. Um, yeah, and use social value, you know, the use social validation. If people are criticizing the same things in your work, even if you don't agree, consider that you may be doing something wrong. For the second type of denier, you need to avoid your desire to just escape and forget it all. Just because the work isn't perfect doesn't mean you should devolve into a Netflix binging spree. Uh, but I like Netflix. (laughs) I like Netflix. But you know, in either case, when the harsh reality that you need to improve hits, you can expect stage two, anger. There is just no way around it. When you write and publish a book, you're in for some disappointment from the criticism you're going to receive. James Joyce's Ulysses, which is a classic piece of literature, has been criticized. And Stephanie Myers, the twi- uh, her Twilight series, is a best-selling series that has also been criticized. James Joyce's response, of course, is much more tampered because, you know, he's dead. <laughs> but whether it's your first time receiving critiques for your novel or being rejected by an agent or trying to wrap your head around some crazy idea you're supposed to embrace, the frustration will inevitably result in some level of anger. Sure, and part of that may just be normal defensiveness, and part of it may be because you're not hearing what you wanted to hear, which is, wow, this book is great. (laughs) Well, it's normal to get angry, and it seems very unfair after all your hard work that others aren't a little more supportive or at least more careful with their criticism. In the anger stage... We often have one or all of the three reactions. We yell at each other, we yell at ourselves, or we project the blame. In the first case, before you start a social media war or call your critics stupid poopy heads, um, consider (laughs) what part you played in the criticism. Yes, they may be unforgiving or they may be overgeneralizing the issues, but if any part of what they say is true... You have to own that part of it. If you're fighting several social media battles over your book, it's a pretty good sign you're in the anger stage. And in the second, it's okay to be mad at yourself that you made mistakes. But also remember to take a step back, take a break, and get a fresh perspective before you start screaming, I suck at everything. If you angrily attack your own writing skills and have internal conversations about your unworthiness and uselessness, Uh, you're probably in the anger stage. And the third outcome is a little more challenging, mostly because it's the wrong focus, but also partly because some of it may actually be true, although unchangeable. You can recognize the blame game because you'll have 
angry thoughts such as if only my job my spouse my friends weren't so demanding if people or kids didn't constantly interrupt my writing i would have done a better job or i'd have finished sooner you know why do you have to pay bills or feed your family why does facebook even exist those bastards <laughs> in any case that sudden recognition that your work needs work can go from frustrating to infuriating. And sometimes you just want to scream. It's normal because suddenly your dream of wanting to write a book has turned into a terrifying nightmare. But thankfully, anger dissipates. So what happens? Well, most of us just end up moving on to the third stage, which is bargaining. You see, anger is not a state the human body wishes to maintain. It's stressful even at a cellular level level. I would love to tell you sometime about the story about boons and stress. But anyways, the brain works hard to shut it down, either through a verbal or physical outburst, or through the creation of what is called a psycho-emotional balance strategy. We call this mental strategy rationalizations. And as the anger dissipates, you still struggle with regaining control of the situation. Since improvement, such as rewriting the book, is too long a process for such an immediate need, the writer in the third stage attempts a shortcut. The shortcut is called bargaining. Bargaining comes in many forms. It's a self-negotiation that focuses on changing rationalizations for your errors rather than changing the errors themselves. Yeah, for example, you might invest your time in finding some exception to the rules that you can apply to your choices. Things like, well, I read in 10 years, classic grandma will be dead anyway, so why do I have to read it? Or you may make invalid comparisons such as, Hey, Stephen King, J.K. Rowling, and George R.R. R. Martin write 1,000 plus page books. So why can't my book beat their length? Or, and perhaps the worst is, you'll create explanations for your bad writing choices, grasping at straws to save the work you already completed. Basically, trying to defend the indefendable. If only you could make a deal with a sorcerer at this point, you'll Gladly promise you're firstborn. <laughs> Look, a good parent teaches independence anyway. So. Fly, birdie, fly. <laughs> yes, fly away. But seriously, in the bargain stage, we can get desperate enough to forget logic. So in the end, most of us have very little luck with our bargaining efforts. Yeah, and the answer isn't to spend your whole life reading every book on writing and, and on the publishing industry, but it's also not to pretend certain rules or conventions aren't important or that they don't apply to you. If your response to justified criticism is that you're too good a writer to concern yourself with things like acceptable word count, antiquated grammar rules, or silly things like sticking to a genre, which is hard, by the way, you're putting a noose around your neck. Yet sooner or later, to be a great writer, you'll need to play by the most important rules, which means if it doesn't come natural, you're going to have to work. And that realization almost always leads to stage four, which is depression. This is a point when we feel the most hopeless. And it's like the second stage, but instead of feeling angry, now you're feeling crushed. Your entire writer's belief system has been challenged. It's a heavy weight to accept the fact that you need to improve and that the improvement's going to take a lot of work. Sometimes this stage includes a bit of a pity party. <laughs> Life isn't fair. Everyone hates you. And yes, your novel sucks. The most difficult part is often finding the motivation to move on and to find the right perspective. Do you salvage some of the work? Do you start over? Should you stop writing for a while? Should you stop writing forever? <laughs> Writers deal with this stage in different ways. They either drink heavily, keep busy with family, or like me, they bury themselves in ice cream and pizza and generally hide from civilization. You know, I know this is a bad thing, but it's almost starting to sound like a little bit of fun. Pizza, drinking, carbs. Anyways, the result of depression is almost always procrastination. Which seems to come up whenever we talk about writing in general. And it's not surprising that depression can trigger procrastination since it's the seductive enemy of anyone who's trying to create something. Depression results in more than just a lack of productivity. Writer's brains aren't filled with only story ideas. They're loaded with insecurities, doubts, and uncertainties. Yeah, and being depressed doesn't just make it difficult to write. It can make it difficult to even know what to write. And in this mood, it's easy to become convinced that you'll never feel like writing again. What you want to avoid is a cycle of being too glum to write, followed by beating yourself up for not writing, 
followed by a month long binge of carbs and burgers. Although the carbs and burgers sounds pretty good to me. I don't need to be depressed to have a month long binge of that or Netflix. <laughs> yeah, that happens naturally. The solution is to take some time for yourself, switch to a different creative endeavor if you have other interests, exercise a little more, or even treat yourself to something nice. The point is to take a little bit of time to regroup and refocus, to remember why you love to write, and to gain some perspective. Yeah, chances are all is not lost. You just need a little emotional recovery time, but be sure to set a hard date for when you'll begin writing again so you don't forget that you have to go back to this. And then celebrate because on the other side is the final stage, which is acceptance. In every successful writer's career is that point where they accept that writing is a process of small steps and improvement occurs over time. Did you ever consider the term savant? I mean, we've heard of children who can play a musical instrument like a pro or the 12-year-old math genius or the 15-year-old who goes to MIT for engineering. But have you ever in your life heard of a 10-year-old who writes an award-winning novel? No, because as smart as they are or as smart as we are, writing is an art. And that art requires time and practice. You usually hear long-term best-selling authors who admit they would never go back and read their breakout novel because it's too embarrassing. Listen, we all need our first book. What separates the embarrassment of book number one from the excellence of book number 10 is acceptance that we need to improve. Acceptance is a stage that separates real writers from the dreamers. The wannabe writers will keep sulking while those who truly have a love and passion for the craft get up and get to tackling revisions. Because they'll fix that thing until that thing makes them proud. Or they'll stop fixing and accept that it really is great as is. Yeah, acceptance means we finally understand that it isn't the world preventing us from writing a masterpiece or living our dream. It's just us. Yeah, it's the ability to stop taking all these challenges and obstacles personally. And it doesn't mean that everything is okay. Is that we have hope that it will turn out that way and we have the determination to actually work for it. A part of acceptance is also creating a plan. A plan that has a healthy relationship with what needs work and what is good and doesn't require work in our writing. And once you've reached this stage, you'll begin to have a much clearer and more objective idea of where to put your efforts. I agree. And the best part is you won't take every criticism as a personal attack. You'll be able to see subjective opinion from objective advice. And you'll use both your time and your resources more effectively. Yeah, we still might take those criticisms personally. But <laughs> yes. the, the fact is you can't bargain with this stage. Getting here might take you a year. It might take you five, ten. Unfortunately, you just have to live through the stages. Oh, goodness. It can be a long journey. And you may come out a little bruised. But I promise you this. You'll also be a little smarter and a lot stronger. And that objective perspective, that healthy relationship with reality, it can really save some of your best ideas from going into the trash. <laughs> when you were faced with the question of, should I continue and research and edit, or should I ditch it, you'll choose to work harder, to keep writing, and to thrive. You know, it's sad, but many writers, when faced with the hardship involved, they simply bail out way before they make it to this final stage. And it's so sad because this acceptance is the main stage, the place where masterpieces are written upon. It's the place where your work can achieve true validation. So to tie it all in, let's finish with some general practices to help you survive any stage and to reach the overall emotional state needed for improvement. And the first is strive for a work-life balance. Creativity requires energy, but it also requires rest. A writer writes about life, but they also need to live a life. Yeah, balance, learning, and writing. It's a big business with lots of details, and it can be a lot to get your head around. Take your time, have a plan, and take the education one step at a time. And sleep. So many writers fit their work in during the hours that others are sleeping, but writers need it too. Every study shows that sleep deprivation results in lower cognitive and creative skills. And read. Read, 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 read a lot. One of the best ways to improve is to expose yourself to other work and split that reading time between fiction and nonfiction. And if you're not reading, get up and exercise. You know, sitting kills your body, literally. And it's easy for a writer to spend 10 hours at their computer. 
Plus, exercise clears your head and it releases endorphins that make you feel better. Yeah, and one of my favorites, you keep a journal and write by hand. Not only is a journal an inspirational source of ideas, but research shows the hand-mind connection is critical to creativity and reasoning. And I think one of the most important things is to have fun with it. You know, not every chapter needs to be a masterpiece. Enjoy the process and remember, this isn't just work. It's your passion. Yeah, and go through the feedback you receive, enjoy the compliments, and learn from the criticism. And challenge your own thinking. Double check the things you believe to be true. Research ideas you don't agree with, not to prove them wrong, but to learn how to authentically defend them in your own fiction. And also help other writers. Usually helping another writer can teach you things about your own work. Use meditation or music to find your focus and clarity. You know, you can't force the writing and 10 good minutes is better than two painful hours. Most importantly, approach your writing with your eyes and your mind wide open. By doing some homework and being curious and open-minded to feedback and knowing it won't be easy, but believing you can overcome it, that gets you off to a great start. Yeah, only you can take charge of your writing. Being creative is a roller coaster ride whose cost of admission is these emotional stages. Paying the price means you'll reach a right state of mind to continue to improve book after book. So we'll leave you with this quote from martial arts master Bruce Lee. Defeat is a state of mind. No one is ever defeated until defeat has been accepted as a reality. Ah, excellent grasshopper. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Writer's Podcast. Be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. For more articles, news and advice, visit our website, writersafterdark.net or follow us on Facebook and Twitter. The Writer's Podcast is a Writer's After Dark radio production. Executive Producers S.K. Anthony and Raymond Esposito. Copyright 2017.